Okay, for today's tutorial, we're going to take a look at how electronegativity impacts all of these things right here. You can find the electronegativity of any element simply by going to reference table S and looking it up on the electronegativity table. Electronegativity is simply this. An atom's attraction to electrons in a chemical bond. An atom's attraction to electrons in a chemical bond. An atom's attraction to electrons in a chemical bond. An atom's attraction to electrons in a chemical bond. I have an electron. I want that electron. Give it to me now. Oh no. Oh yeah. So when two atoms bond together, the atom with higher electronegativity is the one that's going to gain electrons. And the atom that has less electronegativity is the one that's going to lose them. So in chemical bonding, you can tell what kind of bond you have just by simply looking at the difference in the electronegativities of the two elements in question. The electronegativity difference. For a bond to be ionic, you've got to have a pretty big difference between the two electronegativities. One atom is going to have low electronegativity, so it can lose its electrons. The other will have high electronegativity, so it can steal electrons from the other atom. On average, an electronegativity difference of 1.7 or more is considered ionic. And the bigger the difference in electronegativity between the two bonding atoms is, the more ionic character it has, the more ionic it is. That was a more ionic thing for me to say. In covalent bonding, one unpaired valence electron from one atom and an unpaired valence electron from another atom come together and pair up so that the two atoms share their unpaired valence electrons. That shared pair of electrons is called a covalent bond. Now, not all atoms want to share evenly. Sometimes you're going to have a difference in electronegativity where one atom uh, wants the electrons a little bit more than the other atom. If the difference in electronegativity is on average, 0.5 to 1.7. Again, this is kind of a, about 1.7. 1.7 is kind of like the average cutoff, where you got 50% ionic, 50% covalent. Anyway, um, anywhere in that region would be considered polar covalent. Now, there are some texts that will tell you that any electronegativity difference at all above zero would be considered polar covalent, but for New York State standards, 0.5 to 1.7 is what we're going with. Nonpolar covalent is when you share those electrons evenly because this atom, this atom, did you know you're an atom, have the same electronegativity, so neither one wants electrons more than the other. So an electronegativity difference of zero to 0.4 not a very big difference in electronegativity would be considered nonpolar. Here we have a series of different molecules. We're going to tell whether the bonds here, these shared pairs of electrons, are polar or nonpolar. Chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.2. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Sulfur has an electronegativity of 2.6. Fluorine is the ultimate bad boy of the periodic table. Its electronegativity is 4.0. Nobody can beat that. And finally, nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0. So let's see if we can figure out what kind of bonds we have here. The difference between 3.2 and 3.2 is zero. That makes this bond right here a nonpolar covalent bond. There's no difference in electronegativity. Oh shoot, forgot about carbon. Carbon's 2.6. The difference here between 2.1 and 2.6 is 0.5. That puts us in the polar covalent range. That means this bond is polar covalent, this bond is polar covalent, this bond is polar covalent, and that bond is polar covalent. The difference between 2.1 and 3.0 is 0.9. Again, that puts it in the polar covalent range. That's a polar covalent bond, that's a polar covalent bond, that's a polar covalent bond. The difference between 2.1 and 3.5 is 1.4. Again, that puts it firmly in the polar covalent camp. This is a polar covalent bond here, and here's another polar covalent bond there. The difference between 2.1 and 3.2, 
that happens to be 1.1 again putting it in the polar covalent side this bond right here is a polar covalent bond the difference between 3.5 and 2.6 is 0.9 that means that these bonds here are polar covalent as well as these bonds here polar covalent bonds this is a double bond between the oxygen and the carbon. Here's another double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. The difference between hydrogen's 2.1 and sulfur's 2.6 is 0.5. Again, that's a polar covalent bond right here and right here. The difference in electronegativity between hydrogen's 2.1 and fluorine's 4.0, that comes out to a whopping 1.9. Now, you might remember that we said around 1.7, you start getting into ionic territory. Here's the exception to that. HF is a polar covalent bond, but it's a really polar covalent bond with a lot of ionic character to it. And the difference between hydrogen's 2.1 and this hydrogen's 2.1 is zero, making that bond non-polar covalent. So based on the difference in electronegativity between your bonded atoms, you can tell what kind of bond is going to hold them together. A polar covalent, where it's unevenly shared, or a nonpolar covalent, where it's evenly shared. The next place where electronegativity is important is in molecules, determining the polarity of molecules. Because if you know if a molecule is polar or nonpolar, you'll be able to tell what the strength of its attractive forces between different molecules are the melting point and boiling point of the molecule, and what kind of vapor pressure to expect from that molecule. What you do is you take a look at the molecule and you draw lines of symmetry that slice the molecule in half. Let's do that for the molecules we have up here. This molecule can be cut two ways and be mirror images. If you cut it this way, this half and this half are the same. If you cut it this way, that half and that half are the same. This has two lines of symmetry. This molecule here, if you cut it in half this way, same on top as it is on the bottom. If you cut it top to bottom, it's the same as it is on both sides. Then you can cut it diagonally like this, that side's a mirror image of that side, and if you slice it like this, that side's a mirror image of that side. Four lines of symmetry. This molecule here can only be sliced one way to be a mirror image on both sides. If you try to slice it like this, this hydrogen is not mirror imaged on top. Is that a word, mirror image? Anyway, so that only has one line of symmetry. Over here, this molecule of water can only be divided in half that way to be a mirror image on both sides. Again, that has one line of symmetry. This molecule here can be divided in half like this to be a mirror image top to bottom. One line of symmetry. This molecule here can be divided in half this way to be a mirror image on top and bottom, or it can be divided this way to be a mirror image side to side. This molecule here can only be chopped in half that way, that's one line of symmetry. This molecule can only be chopped in half this way, one line of symmetry. This molecule can be chopped in half this way, top to bottom, or this way, side to side. Two lines of symmetry. Okay? Now, according to this chart here, Two or more lines of symmetry indicates a nonpolar molecule, where zero or one lines of symmetry indicates a polar molecule. Okay, again, two or more, nonpolar. Zero to one, polar. Two lines of symmetry, nonpolar. More than two lines, nonpolar. Two lines, nonpolar. This one here, two lines, nonpolar. Now, I want you to notice something. The polarity of the bond doesn't really impact, well it does, but it doesn't really indicate the polarity of the molecule. Here's the deal, we've got a polar covalent bond here, polar covalent bonds here, but let's see, oxygen on this side is pulling with 3.5, the oxygen on this side is pulling with 3.5, so even though each of these two bonds are polar, they cancel each other out because they're the same kind of polarity, therefore the whole molecule has no polarity at all. You can say the same thing about this molecule, each of these bonds is a polar covalent bond, but since hydrogen's pulling with 2.1 in each direction and carbon's pulling with 2.6 in the center, that means no side wins out in terms of where the electrons go, making the whole molecule nonpolar. On the other hand, one line of symmetry is polar molecule. 
In polar molecules, one end of the line of symmetry has greater pull than the other end of the line of symmetry. Now I know what you're saying, you add these two up, you get 4.2, but you don't add them up, because what's happening is this. The oxygen is pulling electrons from this hydrogen and the hydrogen over here, leaving this side of the molecule partially positive. Since the electrons are being pulled towards the oxygen end and electrons are negative, that makes the oxygen end partially negative. That's why we call it a polar molecule. It's got oppositely charged poles that make it up. Same deal here. The chlorine is pulling with 3.2, the hydrogen only with 2.1. So the electrons are being pulled toward the chlorine, making this partially negative, this partially positive. Over here in this nonpolar molecule, nonpolar molecule, it's not doing anything, but over here, this hydrogen's being pulled in 2.1 to 3.0. This one's being pulled in 2.1 to 3.0. This hydrogen's having its electrons pulled in 2.1 to 3.0. Since they're all being pulled towards the nitrogen, the nitrogen is partially negative, leaving the other side of this dipole to be partially positive. It's called a dipole because it's got two poles, partially positive and partially negative. Same goes for this molecule. Electrons are being pulled towards the sulfur with its higher electronegativity. Same with this molecule. Now, if we compare these two molecules that are the same shape in terms of their electronegativity difference, oxygen is 3.5, whereas sulfur is only 2.6. So this molecule here, the water molecule, is significantly more polar than hydrogen sulfide. Now it turns out that water, H2O, is a liquid at room temperature, whereas hydrogen sulfide, whew, is a gas at room temperature. They're basically the same shape. Sulfur is a much bigger atom than oxygen is because it's got an extra energy level. So why on earth would this be a gas and this be a liquid? If anything, the bigger molecule, the one with the bigger sulfur, should be a liquid. Well, it comes down to attractions between the molecules. See, what happens is this. The partially positive end of one molecule is going to attract the partially negative end of the other molecule, and so on, on down the line. Or you could do it like this. Positive attracted to negative, negative attracted to positive. That would be a, more or less in the solid phase. I'm going to throw another one up here. Blah, there, like that. Okay, there you go. Now, the stronger the attractive forces are between these two ends of the molecule, the harder it's going to be to break them apart. In other words, the higher the temperature has to be to break them apart. So to break these attractive forces, you add heat. and Eventually, you get to the melting point. And you add heat of fusion, and you break those molecules apart. Believe it or not, the whole heat of fusion deal, also affected by electronegativity. Okay, so here you go. Now they're in the liquid phase, but they're still following each other around. Partially positive to partially negative, partially negative to partially positive. This is why water can still hold together in a glob, a raindrop falling from the sky. It doesn't just scatter because the molecules of water are basically kind of like, you ever see a dog sniff another dog's butt? Well, that's basically what's going on here. This molecule sniffing that one's butt, this molecule sniffing that one's butt, this molecule sniffing that one's butt. And the more attracted they are to the other molecule's butt, then the more stronger attractive forces are going to be, and so the higher the temperature required to break them apart. And again, if you want to break this liquid apart to form a gas, you've got to put in enough attractive forces to break them apart, to break them apart to the point where they no longer have attractive forces because they're moving so fast that they don't have time to stop and be attracted to the other one. It's kind of like a dog flying down the road. There's another dog going, and the dog flying down the road doesn't have time to sniff nobody's butt because it's running too fast. So depending on how strong the partially negative and positive end of the molecules are, it's going to determine what melting point and boiling point temperature the substance has.